G'day, Starlo here. In part one of this masterclass about catching brim on lures, both hard and soft, I took you out in my kayak on a snag-studded coastal creek for a red-hot brim session. I hope you really enjoyed it, and if you haven't seen it yet, make sure you check it out. But what I want to do in part two is really drill down into the nitty-gritties. I want to talk to you about the gear that I use, the way I rig it, the lures I choose, and in particular, how I present and work those lures to catch brim in a wide range of different scenarios. So to kick off, let's head back to the Fishertopia studio and have a closer look at the gear. In my opinion, tackle selection is absolutely critical when it comes to consistently catching brim on lures. It's one of those styles of fishing where seemingly minor and incremental improvements in the performance of your fishing gear can actually result in much better strike and catch rates. That's mostly because we're trying to cast little lightweight lures accurately over reasonable distances, something that's much easier to do with quality tackle. This is especially important when it comes to choosing rods, because as far as I'm concerned, the rod is the most critical component in the brim catching equation. So spend a couple of hundred bucks and get yourself a decent rod. Now I make no apologies at all about being a dyed in the wool Shimano man. I've been using their gear for well over 30 years and I trust it. So you're only going to see Shimano gear in my video, but that doesn't mean that you can't use other gear. But if you do, choose a reputable brand and select gear from the mid to upper end of their range. You want something that's light, sensitive, well balanced and built with quality componentry on a high modulus blank. That simply means a blank that recovers quickly and crisply when it's springing back straight after being bent. You do not want a soft sloppy rod that bounces up and down for several seconds after being loaded and released. I've used so many different rods over the past 25 years. When I first started out we had to get them custom built because there just wasn't anything available straight off the rack that ticked all the boxes. These days, luckily, all that's changed and you can buy some great rods straight off the rack. But like I said, don't be afraid to spend a few bucks on the rod. It is the most important part of the equation. Today, I mostly choose Shimano spin sticks from their premium ranges like the Anarchy, T-Curve, T-Curve Premium, Zadias, and Poison Adrena models. But they've got new stuff coming out all the time. I mostly look for ultra light and light spin rods rated for lines between one and four kilos and suggested casting weights from a gram or two up to about 10 or 12 grams at most. As for length, I must admit to preferring slightly longer rods than some brim anglers. Way back when I started spinning for brim, the average light flick stick was six to six and a half feet long, under two meters. Over the years that's gone up and my favorite lengths for brim luring rods these days are between about six feet, 10 inches and seven and a half feet, say two to 2.3 meters. Sometimes I'll go even longer, up to almost eight feet, especially if I'm looking for extra casting distance or I'm wading the flats and walking the bank. There are really no significant disadvantages in going a bit longer, and I reckon they let me cast that little bit further and also give me a bit more line control. But look, you choose something that suits you between that six and a half, seven and a half foot length, but make sure it's a good rod. When it comes to reels, we're talking about high quality spin reels with plenty of bearings, a good smooth drag system, and neat line laying capabilities so that we don't get tangles and snarl ups. And that mostly means reels from the mid to upper price range from most manufacturers. When it comes to Shimano, that means reels like the Banfords, the Stratix, the Sustains, the Twin Powers, all the way up to the Stellas. But I'll let you in on a little secret. I haven't used a Stella for several years. Look, they're great pieces of kit, don't get me wrong. Absolutely beautiful reels, but I made the decision that I'd rather buy two or three Stratix or Vanfords than one Stella. That way, I get more bang for my buck. It's worth thinking about. But look, Buy reels that you like 
and trust and can rely on. As to the best size of reel for brim spinning, you can use anything from 1000s up to 3000s, and 2500 sizes are probably the most popular. But I've got to say, I love my little thousands. The only thing you need to realize about a thousand is that it doesn't have quite the maximum drag setting, the cranking power, or the sheer line recovery speed of a 2500 or a 3000. So if those things are important to you, go for the larger reels. By the way, just to clear up a little bit of confusion, there's basically no difference between the physical size and weight of a 2500 compared to a 3000 reel. They're basically the same reel, you can just get more line on the 3000, so whichever one you want to use. Speaking of line, that's our next consideration when it comes to lure casting for brim. And the first choice that we have to make is between braided main lines or monofilament or mono, which can be the fluorocarbon or nylon. And I've got to tell you, I always have at least one reel in my arsenal spooled up with fine fluorocarbon line, but all the rest of them are full of skinny braid. I really like the advantages of braid, and those advantages are that it is so thin for its strength and also so that it has very little stretch, which means that it transmits the slightest bump from even a hesitant fish. My preferred lines are Kai Ricky and Power Pro, both from the Shimano Stable, and I use three, four, or six pound breaking strains. But listen, take those rated breaking strains on the spool with a grain of salt, because the manufacturer can put just about any breaking strain they like on there. And I'm here to tell you that just about every braid on the market tests well over its rated breaking strain. So choose Use the finest braid that you can find. It'll cast better and it'll fish better. And you'll rarely break the braid. You've got to use a leader with braid. There are all sorts of great reasons why you shouldn't tie a braid direct to your lure. And we'll go into that in another video. But just trust me, if you're going to use braid, you want to use a leader. And it's nearly always the leader that is going to break rather than the braid, unless you get up into really heavy leaders. So fine braid is definitely my choice of line when it comes to brim spinning. But like I said, I do have that one reel in my arsenal with the super skinny fluorocarbon on it. And there are times and situations when that'll catch your fish and just about nothing else will. So make sure you've got one outfit spooled up with fluorocarbon. And when it comes to leader material to use with your braided line, I absolutely love this stuff. Shimano's Oshia fluorocarbon. For brim fishing, I carry it in everything from four pound up to about 16 pound breaking strain. My go-to leaders for brim luring are normally six or eight pound. I'll drop down to four in super clear conditions or when the fish are extra spooky, and I'll go up to 10, even 12 pound around really heavy structure. And I've even been known to put on a 16 pound leader and skid those brim out of an oyster lease when they're in between the racks. So, it's really a matter of horses for courses. My typical leaders are about a rod length long to start with, but I will lengthen up. Again, if the water's clear and the fish are finicky, I'll go to two, three, even four rod lengths if necessary. But one rod length of this fluorocarbon is a really good starting point. Now, you don't have to use the Oshia fluorocarbon. There are plenty of other good brands out there as well. Just choose something that's nice and clear, comes from a good manufacturer, and something that you can trust. Now, obviously, if I'm joining my braid to this fluorocarbon, and I'm using a leader that's at least a rod length long, that connection is going through the guides every time I cast. And if I go for an even longer leader, it's actually coming back onto the reel and leaving the reel as well as going through the guides. So you need a really slim, compact knot and also one that's as strong as possible. My absolute choice for connections these days is the FG. Now, I'm not going to sit here and try and teach you how to tie an FG knot in this video. There are plenty of other resources out there. Jump online, get on YouTube. There are lots of how-to videos on how to tie the FG. Once you perfect it, it is a fantastic knot, but it is not the easiest connection that you'll ever tie. You will need to practice it a bit. And don't forget also that before the FG came along, we all used double unis or slim beauties or whatever for years and years, and they served us very well. And in fact, out on the water, I'll often revert back to a double uni in the heat of battle when I want to get a lure back in the water after being shredded in the snags or whatever. Double unis are great knot, so is the slim beauty, but the FG has the edge over both of them. So it is worth learning. All right, so we've looked at rods and reels and line and leaders 
Now we get down to the pointy end and have a look at the lures that we're going to attach to the end of those leaders and how we're going to fish them. This is where it starts to get really interesting. I reckon it'd take me the best part of an hour to go through and list every possible lure that might catch a brim under the right conditions. I think we're far better off to just break it down and look at the five major groupings of brim lures. I reckon you should carry a couple of lures from each of these groups every time you hit the water. First up, of course, we've got the soft plastics, rigged either in a standard manner on a jig head or using some other creative techniques that we'll have a look at. Then next, we've got the bibbed hard-bodied lures, both floating and slow sinking. Then we can look at blades and vibes, surface lures which can be great fun to use at the right time and in the right place and then there are the ultra realistic what i'd call creature lures things like the famous cranker crab or the new lure that's taking the brimming world by storm the muss they're well worth having in your kit as well like i said there's plenty of other lures that'll catch brim too things like hair jigs and sinking stick baits you name it if it swims and imitates something that a brim elite you'll catch brim on it. But what I want to do in this video is just look at those two major groupings, the soft plastics and the floating diving and slow sinking hard bodied lures and show you how to use those. Soft plastics really revolutionized brim luring starting a little over 20 years ago. Since then they've caught a lot of brim for a lot of anglers. In fact, if I could only have one style of lure in my tackle box for brim, it'd be a soft plastic. Ideally a curly tailed grub between about 50 and 80 millimeters in length. Something like the ubiquitous and ever popular squidgy wriggler. I've lost count of how many brim I've caught on these things and I reckon it would outnumber the brim that I've caught on every other lure put together. Using a grub like the squidgy is really a bit of a no-brainer and you shouldn't leave home without a few packets in your kit. The bloodworm colour is the most famous and for good reason but all the other colours catch brim too and so do heaps of other brands and makes of grubs. If they look similar and they swim in a similar way, brim will eat them. But at least as important as the soft plastic tail itself is the delivery vehicle that you rig it on. For me, nine times out of 10, that'll be a simple lead-headed jig, most likely with an unpainted round head, but plenty of other varieties of lead-head jig also work. What's critical, however, is how you put the soft plastic on the jig head. Watch this. I've got a little jig head on here. It's only about one and a half, two grams. The lighter the jig head that you can get by with, the more fish you'll catch generally. You want that hang time in the water as the lure sinks. Now, the first thing to do is just to quickly measure up the soft plastic alongside the jig head and have a look where the bend of the hook comes back to because that's where you're going to want the point to come out. Start right in the front of the nose, as dead center as you can get it. And then it's just a matter of sliding it around the bend, not unlike putting a garden worm on a hook. Bring that hook point out at that predetermined spot and then slide the plastic all the way up. Now, that's pretty good, but I'm going to have a good look at it. Make sure it's absolutely straight. Give it a little tweak. One little trick is just to hold its nose there with your fingers and just give it a little bit of a pull just to straighten it out. And I'm really happy with that. I'll be even happier once I put some S-factor on it. It doesn't make fish swim from half a mile away to eat your lure, but what it does is make them hang on to it when they do grab it. I'm still not going to just start fishing blindly with that. I'm going to give it a swim in the water first and make sure that it's behaving correctly. And I'm also going to have a think about what it is that I'm trying to imitate with this lure. It could be a worm, it could be a little prawn, it could be a crab or a bait fish. I'm going to tweak it in the water, watch what it does, and think about that when I cast the lure out there, because what I'm trying to do is put on a puppet show for the fish. Seriously, that stuff might seem really basic, but trust me, if you put a little bit more attention to detail into getting that plastic on there straight and making sure that it swims, you will get a heap more strikes and hook a heap more fish. Now, as to what size and weight of jig head I'm going to use for brim, it really varies depending on the conditions. I like to go as light as I can possibly get away with that hang time that I talked about. That could mean a featherweight one gram jig head in really shallow water with not much current, or it could mean seven grams, a quarter of an ounce, out in deeper water and with a bit of tidal run. It's just a matter of horses for courses. Of course, as well as rigging soft plastics in the standard manner that I've just shown you, you can also rig them in a variety of other ways. And one really useful method is to rig them snag proof or weedless 
so that you can fish them right back in the dense cover without constantly getting hung up. And that was what I was doing in part one of this masterclass when I smacked all those beautiful blue nose brim in that snag studded creek. I had a squidgy's prawn like this one rigged on this special wide gape hook with a weight molded onto the nose of it. Now you don't have to use that. You can use an ordinary jig head and rig it snag proof or weedless. Here's how. I'm using a heavy gauge jig hook with a light head. The thick hook resists straightening when fishing very tight drags, but it's absolutely critical that your hook point is sticky sharp. That point needs to grab your skin at the lightest touch. Now, take your soft plastic tail, push the hook point dead center into its nose and bring it out the plastic's chin. Push the plastic right up the hook over the keeper and then rotate the tail on the hook like this. Next, spear the hook point up through the belly of the plastic, keeping it dead center. Push the point up until it just begins to protrude from the back of the soft plastic. Only enough so you can feel it with your finger. When a fish takes the plastic, you'll need to strike fairly hard to punch the point through and pin the fish. You can bring the point out a bit more to improve the hookup rate, but you'll also get snagged more often, so I like to keep it slightly concealed. Once you've got the plastic on the jig head, it's time to get it in the water and start fishing it. And a lot of people seem to struggle with this too. There's no great magic to it. Get the lure in there, get it down into the strike zone, which usually means all the way to the bottom, at least to start your retrieve, and then work it nice and slowly with plenty of stops and starts and lifts and drops of the rod. Everyone I know has got a slightly different way of working a soft plastic. Some do a double jig, some do a triple jig, some just lift and drop. They all catch fish. However, interestingly, on a particular day, one style of presentation is likely to outfish all the others. You've got the job of finding out what works best on the day. But what I can tell you without doubt is that a lot of people fish their soft plastics way too fast and they don't keep them down there in the strike zone. Take your time. Fish will eat these things when they're sinking through the water or when they're sitting on the bottom. So slow down and give that soft plastic time to work its magic. Okay, so the other major lure group I want to talk about in this masterclass is the floating diving or slow sinking hard bodied lure. These are fantastic weapons for catching brim. But again, a few little nuances will make a big difference. For starters, you want to use small ones, definitely under seven or eight centimeters in length, down to four or five centimeters, a lot of the best ones are, which means they're quite light, and that's why you need that light well-balanced tackle to be able to cast them effectively. Once you get them in the water, how you fish them can have a huge bearing on how many strikes you get. In most cases, again, you need to slow down a little bit, and I reckon you need to incorporate regular pauses into your retrieve. Watch this. Really important, I find, with southern black brim on hard bodies to incorporate lots and lots of pauses into the retrieve. Just let the lure stop, slowly rise in the water column, and that's often when they hit it. If you just crank it, you don't catch anywhere near as many. You'll catch plenty of yellowfin brim by just cranking a hard body, but these southern black brim, they love pauses. The other big secret with hard body lures is to maximize their actions. Don't cramp their style by tying the leader tight to the eyelet. It's alright if it's got a split ring or a little clip already on the front, that'll free it up. But if it just has an eyelet, use a loop knot. And I use a uni knot loop. Here's how. Oh, what a gorgeous fish. And look at that shimmy. Hmm. That is a lovely, lovely fish. Immaculate condition. In you go, mate. <laughs> I reckon the loop knot. Yup, she's locked down again. Yep, I'm gonna retie. It's nice having a fresh knot for each fish anyway. There are other loop knots you could use, but I don't trust them in, in the real light stuff. I like the uni. Give yourself a bit of line to play with. Form the backhand loop and I go through five times when I'm um, doing the loop or even six certainly no less so instead of sliding it all the way down I keep these fingers there and just lock it in place pull on the tag tighten everything up and there you go you've got a little loop 
like I said, but will slide down. Oh, look, and when you trim your tag ends off, don't just drop them in the creek or on the ground. Take them home with you, even those little bits of nylon. It all adds up. I'll retie my lure a dozen, 15, 20 times during a hot session. It's worth doing. Well, that's about it. We've taken a deep dive into the tackle, the line, the leaders, the lures, the presentation strategies that you'll need to catch brim wherever they live right around the Australian coastline. I hope you enjoy your brim fishing as much as I have for the last 20 or 30 years. It's challenging, rewarding, and just so much fun. I also hope that you really enjoyed this masterclass. And if you have, let me know. Until next time, this is Starlo wishing you tight lines. <laughs> <laughs>